uh, open the Bible in just a minute. But uh, before we do that, uh, another little reading for you to see if you recognize these words. Some of you will, I'm sure. Some of you will be looking at me with some question marks. You might belong in Gryffindor, where dwell the brave at heart. Their daring nerve and chivalry set Gryffindors apart. As I say, some of you will recognize those words. It is maybe uh, fairly conventional for preachers to quote a variety of sources and that kind of thing uh, when they speak. Quoting from a talking hat is different, uh, but maybe a first time for everything. When Harry Potter made his appearance uh, 20 years ago or thereabouts, many Christian people were just appalled by what they read and uh, very protective about those around them. What are we doing letting our young people read about magic and sorcery? How, how unchristian can you get? It wasn't long, though, before something began to click, uh, that although the Harry Potter world does look very different to the world of the Bible, the author, J.K. Rowling, had deliberately woven in some very clear biblical themes that shine out against that dark backdrop. Then themes like the reality of good and evil, the triumph of good over evil, the beauty of self-sacrificial love and friendship, uh, a Judas character of betrayal, a Peter character of restoration, themes like salvation and resurrection. But most obvious of all, courage. For a whole generation of young people, Harry and his friends have become go-to reference points for what it is to be bold and brave. There is Harry entering the, the terrifying chamber of secrets or giving himself to, up to Voldemort to save his friends or taking a taking on the troll to, to rescue Hermione, whatever the challenge, he seems to be up for it. And actually, we want to be like that, don't we? We do. We've, we've been showing, showing an example of true courage, and we want to be that guy. Of course, Harry Potter isn't the only place you might look for inspiration. Other characters are available. Uh, Katniss Everdeen, Joe Sharp, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Frodo Baggins. There are even apparently some real life people who have walked that path and proved inspiring. People who've taken some initiative in spite of the risk, or in fact, who've simply kept doing what they were already doing in spite of pressure to stop. And it's that kind of courage that we're confronted with in Acts chapter 4, which we're going to read in just a moment. Because in this chapter, a new era dawns. The era of the persecution of Christians for their faith. All the things that happen today to Christian people around the world just for being known as Christians, whether it's the Chinese Communist Party arresting Christian educators in Jiangsu or a mob in Nigeria kidnapping scores of children from a Christian school or threats to Christian people in Afghanistan or imprisonment of another 15 Christians in Eritrea, just to name a few things from the last few months. All of that, and, and even the more subtle pressure that you and I feel just to stay quiet about our faith, it all starts here in Acts chapter 4. So uh, as the passage is read now, listen out for what the pressure looked like and, and maybe see if you can spot, as it's read, what it was that fed the courage of those believers as they kept speaking. I'll lead us in prayer and then we'll hear God's word together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we have to sit under your word to hear your spirit speaking to us, equipping us, giving us what we need to live in this world as disciples of Jesus. And we long now that 
you would give us ears to hear what you have to say to us today. Make our hearts humble. Make our minds supple. Give our hearts what we need to persevere in discipleship as we read this now. Amen. Uh, the reading today is from Acts chapter 4, uh, verses 1 to 31, and that can be uh, found on page 1095 of the Church Bibles. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas the high priest was there, and so was Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how, it was, how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to, a man, uh, given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. Carrying on in verse 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly.
Thank you. Well, it's an inspiring story, isn't it? I remember reading uh, Acts chapters 4 and 5 as a student 30 years ago, and uh, the effect of these chapters on me being transformative in terms of moving outwards, looking outwards, uh, getting ready to take on the world, as it were, as I entered my, my adult life. It's inspiring. But you see what it's a story about? It's very simple. It's just a story about Christian people speaking of Jesus and keeping speaking of Jesus despite what comes their way. There they are, uh, Peter and John, verse 1. What are they doing? Uh, end of verse 1, they are speaking to the people. And uh, flip to the end of the uh, section, of verse 32, what are they doing at the end? They spoke the word of God boldly. And all the way through, they're doing the same thing. Despite all the attempts to shut them down, they just keep doing the same thing. They're speaking about Jesus, which clearly takes some courage. Most of us, I imagine, would have gone quiet and uh, um, you know, just shut up uh, promptly, given a fraction of the pressure they experienced. But they refused to go quiet. They kept speaking. They kept speaking whatever beliefs their opponents held. See that in the opening verses. Uh, do you spot it in, in verse 1? Uh, who was actually in the Ofsted inspection team uh, that day uh, who came round? The, the, the crew there that comes out and checks out Peter and John's teaching? There they are, usual suspects, uh, priests, temple guard, but also who's the other, the other uh, contingent there? The Sadducees, you see that? Those whose defining belief was there is no resurrection of the dead. Now, I wonder what went through Peter's and John's minds when they saw those guys in the crowd. A temptation to draw back a bit, perhaps, maybe modify their lesson plan for the day. That would be you and me, wouldn't it? I mean, these are serious people. You don't want to mess with these guys. But no, not a bit of it. See what they explicitly include in their curriculum that day. End of verse 2. They were proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Now there's courage, isn't it? With an audience like that in front of you. And there's more. They kept speaking whatever power their opponents wielded. Those willing to speak truth to power are often in short supply, aren't they? Especially where the particular truth being spoken is not to the taste of the particular people currently in power. Well, the authorities here, they certainly have no taste for it. And in verse 3, they flex their muscles and show what they can do. They put them in jail until the next day. And so when Peter and John are, are faced with an even bigger, hostile audience the next day, again, you, you'd think they might pull their punches. And th these guys have shown they can make life very awkward for those who don't toe the line. One night in jail might look like a walk in the park compared to what could be coming. And yet it's amazing. They don't moderate at all, do they? Uh, their ministry yesterday was what? Verse 1, to speak. Verse 2, to teach and uh, to proclaim. Those are the three words that are used. What do they do today? Verse 10, they speak about Jesus. Verse 11, they teach, open up the Bible, quote Psalm 118, show how it applies to Jesus and so on. And verse 12, they proclaim. They explain how their message is absolutely vital to everyone. Speaking, teaching, proclaiming. The same ministry yesterday as today. Nothing has changed. Send us back to prison if you must. But we are not shutting up, is what they're saying. And again, they kept speaking whatever directives their opponents might issue. Actually, the panel here, they're a bit stymied, aren't they? They're not quite sure what to do, given what they see. They're dealing with transformed disciples. Verse 13, these men had gone from uneducated, regular guys, 
to fiery preachers. They're dealing with a transformed patient. Verse 14, a crippled beggar was now completely healed. And actually, they're dealing with a transformed local residence group. Verse 16, uh, everyone in Jerusalem now knows something big has happened. So all they can think of is to instruct them to stop. Verse 18, they, they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But the response? Verse 19, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. They won't be silenced. They're, they're like those... Yeah, those cheap kids' toys that seem to litter the homes of young families at Christmas time, uh, when they, you know, the aunts and uncles have been and given their little presents and things like. You know the kind of thing I mean. Those little toys that come out with those stock phrases and, "Hey you, want to have some fun?" Hey hey hey, or whatever it is. They don't seem to have an off button. You end up stuffing them down the back of the sofa at two o'clock in the morning just to try and get some sleep. They kept speaking whatever beliefs their opponents held, whatever power they wielded, whatever directives they issued, they kept at it. And indeed, whatever threats they make. In verse 21, we read of Peter and John being released from custody, but not before being warned again after further threats. Yet still they're not cowed. Flip across to chapter 5, verse 28, if you just turn over the page in your Bibles, perhaps. This is their next run-in with the authorities after this one. What do they say? We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. They simply refused to stop talking about Jesus. Whatever the risks, whatever the potential consequences, they're prepared to take them. But why? What is it that drives them on? That is our question today. I mean, there are always people who won't stop talking, aren't there? I'm sure you know somebody like that. If you don't know someone like that, then maybe you are that person. <laughs> thing is, though, even those over-talkers that we know would probably put a sock in it if there were obvious consequences, like prison. So what is it that gives these two men the courage to keep speaking despite the consequences? We want to know, don't we? Imagine those people that I mentioned in China, and Nigeria, and Afghanistan, and Eritrea. They'd want to know. And you and I want to know too, because for most of us, there are people all around us, at work, or in our street, in our family, among our friends, who don't know the gospel, don't know about Jesus, because we've never actually told them. We know more about cowardice than courage. So again, what is it? that's taken Peter from a cowardly, three-time Jesus denier to a courageous, three-time, so far, Jesus proclaimer. It seems to me his courage and John's courage are fed by four convictions. Conviction number one, the gates of heaven are open. In Acts chapter 3, we saw Peter talking about the resurrection of Jesus. And at first glance, it might look like he's still on the same subject. I don't know where the last time you read Acts chapter 3 was, but have a look at verse 2. Uh, there are the words, Jesus and resurrection from the dead. Same subject as chapter 3 just gone by. But no, look more closely, and it's more than that. What are they actually saying? They're proclaiming 
in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. That is, resurrection from the dead is available to others through connecting with Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus himself can be shared in. It's something to be found in him. Or to put it more simply, the gates of heaven are now open because of him. Anyone can now pass from death to life, a new life with God. The offer's on the table. The resurrection of Jesus was not a one-off. It was just the first. Years later, Peter would open his famous letter with these words. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus was the one who rose, but it's a resurrection we all get to benefit in as we connect to him. About a year ago, I was in Australia for that wedding I mentioned earlier on, our eldest child. I was the only member of the family to go. I was the only person in England uh, to to get in. You may remember that Australia was a little bit uh, cagey about international visitors back then, and uh, it was pretty hard to get in. I got in, uh, and while I was there, I borrowed someone's car and drove up into the beautiful Blue Mountains. Anybody here been to Australia? One. Have you been to Sydney and the Blue Mountains? You went to Sydney, but you didn't make it to the Blue Mountains. Ah, next time, next time. They are gorgeous. And everywhere you go in the Blue Mountains, it's interesting, uh, you come across towns and landmarks and waterfalls and so on, and they're all named after the same things, the same people. Blackslam, Wentworth, and Lawson. Everywhere you go. Because it was they, back in 1813, who were the first to forge a way over those mountains. Without it, the settlement that's now become Sydney, one of the great cities of the world, probably wouldn't have survived. It would have been abandoned, died, gone. But Blacksland, Wentworth and Lawson found a way through to the fields and the resources and the water that that lay beyond, things that you need to sustain the life of a great city. They pioneered, but in in their wake, millions followed the road, the train, and everything that those things could bring. Just one expedition to find the way through. But now it's open to all. And, And it's like that with the resurrection of Jesus. He led the expedition to find a way from death to life with God. But now what's over there, what lies beyond heaven itself, is wide open. And when you know that, well, that changes things, doesn't it? Who would want to keep news like that a secret? Conviction number two that fed the courage of those early Christians. It was the conviction that the way of salvation is unique. See what Peter says to the panel here. He says, uh, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now, um, just have a look carefully at those verse, that, that verse, because it's quite tight, uh, quite a tight statement. You've got to kind of unpack it and pick it apart a bit. I think when you look at it, what he's saying is four things in that one verse. One, salvation is available. Two, salvation is a necessity, must. Three, salvation is obtainable in Jesus. And four, salvation is not obtainable anywhere else. Is that a, is that a fair kind of summary of what he's saying there you, when you pick it apart? And, put it into a few propositions. I'm not sure if Peter's hearers would have been particularly impressed by that. I'm certainly, well, very sure that 
many people around us today wouldn't be impressed by that. In fact, it's hard to think of a more contentious set of statements at all. The, the world wants to say to us, what? Chill. Lots of different ways to God. Lots of paths up the, the mountain. They all get you to the same place in the end, don't they? Just relax. To which the obvious response is, what? How do you know? Isn't that the response? How do you know? The different faiths certainly don't claim to be taking you to the same place. Are you saying you sit so far above the mountain that you can see the whole picture from your particular viewpoint? Is that it? You're saying you're above every religion. You're above God himself. Is that what you're saying? Because it certainly sounds like it. It's not the most humble position to take, is it? That's the response, isn't it, to somebody who puts it in those way, in, in that form, that makes that objection. Peter and John say, no, that there is only one way. Now, where did that conviction come from? Presumably from Jesus. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, verse 6. Nobody comes to the Father except by me. But again, if that is your conviction, I mean, if that's really your conviction, deep down, it's going to be hard to keep quiet about Jesus, isn't it? If you are parachuted onto an island where some variant of COVID is rampant and people are dying on every side and you're the only one with the vaccine and, or any understanding of what a vaccine is, what do you do with your days while you're there? Or let me put it this way. What do you do while you're there on the days when it's raining and travelling to clinics is going to mean you're getting wet and uncomfortable and muddy? What do you do on those days? Well, I take it you do the same as you did yesterday, don't you? You get jabbing. Jab, jab, jab as fast as you can. You get wet and uncomfortable because this thing that you've got is the only way to save lives. That is us, isn't it? That's the message of Jesus. It's the only way people can be saved. So we'll take the heat. We'll take the opposition. We'll be fired up to speak because there is no other hope. The way of salvation that we found is unique. But there's more. Conviction number three, feeding this amazing display of courage, is that the instruction they'd received to speak was binding. Uh, during this pandemic era we've been living through, there's been lots of discussion in certain quarters, I don't know if they've reached you, about what the state can and can't tell you to do and what to do when they do tell you to things when you think you shouldn't do them and, and, and so on. When's it right to dis disobey? Civil disobedience has become a hot topic. In the Bible though there's really to date only been two reasons to disobey the state. One is for the worship of God. Remember Daniel and his response to the decree banning prayer for 30 days, he rejects it completely, goes ahead and prays regardless of the decree and suffers the consequences. Personal worship of God. And the other reason to disobey is the protection of life. Remember those midwives at uh, the beginning of the book of Exodus who are told to kill all the baby boys, all the Hebrew baby boys at birth, people like that? They disregard it. The worship of God, the personal worship of God, and the explicit protection of human life. And that's it. The only two reasons to disobey civil authorities so far. But it turns out there's a new member of the club. A third reason to disobey the authorities. A third cause for civil disobedience. Something that is so important it trumps even what the law says. What is it? 
the proclamation of the gospel. Verse 19, Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to him, to, to, to you, or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we've seen and heard. Obedience to the commission of Jesus was non-optional. You will be my witnesses, Jesus had said. There's nothing any authority could say or threaten that would cancel out that responsibility. And so they feel they have no choice. There's no um, unless it's too dangerous or unless it's inconvenient or risky. They have to speak. And they know it. And actually, we who walk in their footsteps, we know it too, don't we? The Great Commission is still in force. There's still work to be done. That's why Reach South exists. That's why we have this partnership. That's why we plant these churches. Because there are more people in more places still to be reached. And it's why Jesus has left you and me here rather than just whisking us off to heaven as soon as we become Christians. Why has he left us here? Because you and I have work to do before our time's up. Jesus has spoken, and so we don't have a choice. And so, to the fourth, deep conviction, feeding the courage displayed by these disciples in Jerusalem, still actually feeding the courage of disciples around the world today. The gates of heaven are open. The, the way of salvation is unique. The instruction to speak is binding. And finally, the Lord of history is on his throne. Um, in the final part of the uh, passage today, uh, the reading that we had, Peter and John get to return finally to their spiritual family for a bit of a debrief. Verse 23, uh, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And they pray. And what a prayer it is that they pray. The main request is actually quite surprising. It is not for comfort in their troubles or relief from their suffering or anything like that. It's actually just asking for more courage. More courage. Verse 29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. But did you spot the basis on which they make their request? It is actually the sovereign control of of God. God, verse 24, is the great creator. You made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. But more than that, God is also the great planner. That uh, psalm of David, Psalm 2, uh, which speaks, uh, verse 25 here, of nations raging and people plotting and kings rising up and rulers banding together against the Lord's anointed, that, that's now been fulfilled, verse 25, uh, 27. In the, the banding together of Herod and Pilate and the Gentiles and Israel against Jesus. But even then, says Peter, they weren't actually thwarting God. At the most anti God moment imaginable, it turns out God was still in control. See that, verse 28? They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. And it's on that basis that they all pray for even more courage. God being still on his throne in all this feeds their courage to speak. If he was in control even then, the suffering of Jesus at Calvary, surely, He's going to be in control tomorrow and the next day and the day after that when they simply speak about Jesus. He can inspire them to, to bravery and accomplish great signs to help them 
in their work. God is on his throne. And what an encouragement that is. Being a Christian and speaking Christian truth does take courage. It always has. It, it always will do, because it's always hard. It's always hard. When Jesus first talked about going to the cross, he made one thing very clear. The path he was treading was to be trodden by all who bear his name. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. If you're a Christian, and um, the person who first explained the Christian faith to you didn't make that clear, then I'm really sorry on their behalf. I want to apologize to you. They've done you a disservice. They've given you a wrong expectation. And if you're not yet a Christian, you're still exploring, that's great you're here, but please can I make this very clear, becoming a Christian might make life easier in some ways. But it will make it harder in other ways. Being at odds with the world around you is always hard. Um, some of you, um, I guess, will have heard of the uh, course known as Christianity Explored. Is that something, is that part of the program here? You, you know Christianity Explored. Yes, you do. Um, well, you may be interested in this. While the course was being designed, the designers ran it past the great John Stott, one of the great 20th century Christian leaders of the world. And they were wondering if they included a day away as part of the course, how should they use it? And his answer, use it to underline the cost of becoming a Christian. Very interesting answer, isn't it? But you can see why he said that. The temptation for the Christian will always be there to meld in, to be quiet. To the, hap that the world is very happy to do a deal with us. The world says to us effectively, keep your beliefs to yourself and we won't give you a hard time for them. That's the deal. It's very tempting, isn't it? Especially for any who have already experienced a taste of real pressure, in mockery, sneering, sidelining, discrimination, persecution. Very tempting indeed. But going private is not an option for the Christian. So we need some of that courage of those first preachers. Which means we need the convictions that they held to, to sink deep into us. Are those convictions there in you? If we took a slice of you, is that what you would bleed? Do they run that deep? Christian brother, Christian sister, we're to be men and women of courage who will not be silenced. So next time you're tempted to hold back, to hold your tongue, remember this. The gates of heaven are open. The way of salvation is unique. The instruction to speak is binding. The Lord of history is on his throne. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, all around us is a world uh, who does not want to hear about Jesus from us. A world which wants to run its own path away from the Lord Jesus. 
and a world which is intent on living that path. And Father, we feel the pressure. We're sorry for those times when we've caved. We're sorry for those times when we've seen opportunities to speak of Jesus, but stayed quiet. We're sorry for the justifications that we've used to ourselves and perhaps even to you. The ways we've told ourselves this isn't the moment. We need to invest in this relationship. We'd just be thought of as weird. We wouldn't be effective. We were sorry for whatever reasons, Father, we've, we've clung to, to justify our silence. We ask that next time we have opportunity to speak, your spirit would bring to mind some of these very things we've been speaking of today. Some of these same convictions those early believers clung to might make them our convictions too. And through that might make us courageous enough to open our mouths. Give us wisdom. Give us sensitivity. Give us love for those we speak to. But this morning we ask that more than that, you would give us the courage to speak in the first place. We ask it for the honor of Jesus, so that honor might be more esteemed by more and more people, and your new creation will be more heavily populated through the words that we say and the witness that we keep. Amen. We're going to close by singing uh, a wonderful song, teaching ourselves and training each other to hold the name of our great God is as great. Let's uh, stand together and sing.